Welcome to She Said Homestead, the podcast that explores homesteading from a range of perspectives. We're Sage and Michaela, two homesteaders, each with unique experiences, properties, and future goals for our homesteads. We're discussing various homesteading topics, sharing our personal experiences as women working full-time who are managing homesteads as well, and shining a light on the stories of other inspiring homesteaders. Before we dive in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review. It really helps us grow and share these homesteading stories with even more people. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Sage from Terra Nova Acres. And I'm Michaela from Calico Cow Acres. And we both have homesteads in Western North Carolina. Today, we're going to be continuing to talk about the cost of homesteading. The episode from last week, if you missed it, was also discussing the same thing, mostly animals. And then today, we're going to be getting into things like general infrastructure, gardens, kitchen supplies, and things like that. We also want to give you guys a quick disclaimer today. The platform that we record on is having some technical issues with our microphones. So if the sound is a little bit different than normal, that's why. And we apologize, but we're working with what we got. But before we dive into the topic, I want to know what you got up to this week. This week has felt like a very long week, but it's also flying by. Um, I've been really just on the computer all week it feels like my brain feels like it's gonna explode um i'm i've been learning a new editing software for our youtube videos and for the podcast too but that switching that up is no joke because i've been switching i switched the program and the laptop and i hate using my not macbook this the the layout of it it's so much different and it stresses me out it's harder to use um but fun thing we built our raised beds and got them put out in the garden and one of them filled up and I started seeds in it. So that's fun. You already direct sowed some seeds outside in those raised beds? I did. I did some lettuce, some spinach, and like bok choy, a couple things like that just around the edges. And then this weekend I'm going to be putting a bunch of carrot seeds and beet seeds in them. Nice. And those raised beds, you're making plans for those, right? That you're going to put up on your website? Yeah, I have a little illustrated set of building plans for them that I drew up. And Taylor helped me with all of the the correct dimensions and materials and stuff that he used. And so they're, like, they're all linked in there. We have them on our website. And I'm excited about it because we have a lot of things we want to make plans for, but this is like the first time I've actually tackled the task of doing it. And I think from (laughs) now on, making the other ones will be a little bit easier now that we've done this first one. What have you been up to this week? (sighs) This week I turned 30. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) So generally contemplating (laughs) what I want the next decade of my life to look like, you know casual casual things but I had a really chill day I joked with my family that I was just gonna turn my phone on do not disturb and become my true mountain hermit self (laughs) so that they knew not to get worried if I didn't respond immediately because I get very overwhelmed when I have several people reaching out to me all at the same time sending messages and you know expecting replies it just stresses me out so um yeah on my actual birthday I worked my normal hours in my job and then I went to grocery store picked up some of my favorite snacks stopped at a friend's house for dinner and uh came back home started seeds very chill was it rainy on your actual birthday (sighs) yes and no (laughs) <laughs> the forecast said that it was going to rain all day, so I didn't plan to do anything. Like, I, I would have gone on a hike <laughs> if I had known that I wasn't going to get caught in bad weather. But it didn't actually rain, but it threatened to rain enough that it kept me at home, which is fine. You know, did did stuff around the homestead, which I never complain about. But <laughs> we need to do like a delayed birthday dinner or something. At some point in the next month or so. That means socializing. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) But yummy food somewhere. (laughs) I saw you go to a brewery that looked good and it was sheep themed. So I'm interested in that. 
<laughs> ah, yeah. So that wasn't on my actual birthday, but sometimes I'll post up to edit <laughs> normally the podcast <laughs> because, you know, I'm I'm at home all day and I'm sitting here on my couch working and sometimes I just want a change of scenery to sit more and work more <laughs> on a slightly different computer. And so I will go to the brewery that's in the town close-ish to me. It's called Leveler. And they, the owners have sheep. I don't know what kind of sheep, but they, they don't have a dairy. Um, uh, but they do have like skeins. How do you say that? Skeins? Skeins? Mm -hmm. I think it's <laughs> I'm not in the knitting world. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's uh, they have yarn from their actual sheep. Uh, so that's cool. And then the names of the beers and things are, you know, sheep themed, farm themed. And uh, I like it a little bit better than the other brewery that's in town. So <laughs> whenever we see a new brewery, we have to look up the all the flavors and just different beers that they have because Taylor's really into craft beers. Like he likes trying new ones. I've slowly started to appreciate some. It was a really long time before I liked any kind of beer. Um, mm. But I prefer like Ginger's Revenge, the hard ginger beer. That's my favorite thing. <laughs> Those are good. I'm a geologist, so it is a prerequisite that I have to <laughs> enjoy beer. All of the social functions for geology or conferences, things like that. Uh, revolve very heavily around beer and drinking several of them. So, <laughs> I think that's just like a, a thing because when I was in grad school in Charlotte, the faculty meetings and stuff were at breweries. Like they hosted everything at local breweries, <laughs> all the events. <laughs> Did you do anything else this week besides have a lonely, happy birthday? Hey, alone <laughs> and lonely are two different things. It's no, no, peaceful. No. So Lonely and <laughs> lonely is not negative in this in this circumstance. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, other that's a good question. Other than the birthday, I moved the chickens into the garden. I did I did start some seeds and move some seeds around, upgrade some seedlings to bigger soil blocks. Uh, I started to kind of clear some brush on the slope. I finished mulching the rest of what's going to be my flower garden on the other side of the driveway. So not the raised beds and things like that, but um, on the other side. So I, yeah, it's just checking, checking some smaller things off the list, but it felt good to get that stuff done because it was one of the first weekends that it hasn't rained the entire time and that I could actually spend some time on outdoors. Has it been warm there? It's been in like the sixties here, almost 70 lately, sometimes high fifties. But tomorrow's supposed to be 65 and sunny, so I'm spending the entire day outside because I've been on the computer way too much. It's been warm-ish, but I think it got down to like 25, 26 last night. So the nights are still dipping cold, but when you walk outside at, you know, 1 p.m., it <laughs> feels pretty good in the sunshine. And it's hard to believe that it's, you know, at least right now when we're recording this, that it's February. I feel the same way. I was just looking at... Um, <laughs> pictures from last year around this time and I realized in a week from now it's stinky tree season so all the the Bradford pears are going to start blooming probably in the next week or two um not really ready for that because they smell horrible but they look pretty <laughs> <laughs> um they look pretty yeah I remember mid-February last year I walked up to the pasture one morning and was like everything is green <laughs> like when did that happen but I also know that last spring it sprung a little early, so I'm mm -hmm. not quite sure how that's how that's going to go this year. But I am I am noticing the signs; like it's it's starting to happen. All of our daffodils have flowers on them, but they're not open yet. So we're like four days behind the daffodils blooming last year right now because it was <laughs> this weekend last year that they were the first ones were blooming. So I've just been trying to keep tabs on that to see when to expect things to happen. And it seems we're just like a few days behind, but I'm excited. I'm excited for green things. The grass here is starting to grow. Our front yard, all the clover is green right now. It's so cool. I'm excited. Wow. <laughs> it seems like you guys are a couple weeks or maybe a week and a half ahead of me. 
because I've noticed clover, but it's like baby, baby, baby. Like it just has started to come back. And I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> it's time to spread the pasture seed. <laughs> it's time to do things. Yep. Like I'm ready, yep. but I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. You're like, am I prepared to be crazy, insanely busy for the next six months from this point? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, a little stressed, pretty excited. <laughs> You can be both. You're allowed to be both. <laughs> All right. Are we ready to start talking about how much things cost again? <laughs> Let's do it. Let's start with just general infrastructure. And the first thing that comes to mind with that is perimeter fencing. My perimeter fence is electrified. Electric fencing is really great for keeping predators out in addition to keeping the animal your animals in. So most fences can be built with T-posts, which are like $5 each. And if you are looking at electrified fences, then obviously you're gonna need insulators on each post. You can do three strands is really common. So is four strands. I personally have four because I have sheep and I just wanted to be thorough. But insulators are gonna run you about $1.50 per post maybe closer to a dollar if you're doing three strand, a dollar fifty if you're doing four strand. And then the actual electrified wire itself, you know, you can get the solid metal wire if you want it to be really, really hot. If you're keeping in stuff like bulls and huge cows, maybe you need that. But for most purposes, the the poly wire, which is plastic with wire sort of woven or braided into it works really well. Uh, so does poly tape, which is just a little bit thicker for visibility purposes. All those things, they're going to run you about $100 per thousand feet. And it's linear feet because it's a length. But obviously that's going to depend on what you get and where you get it from. And then if you have an electric fence, obviously you're going to need some sort of energizer. There are a few options. You can do an AC energizer, which would be just it plugs into an outlet. You can do DC, which connects to a battery. Those two options are going to be generally cheaper than something like solar. My AC charger, I think it's rated for like 15 miles and it's a 0 0.7 joule, which is pretty strong. <laughs> that one <laughs> is about $70. I see a lot in that range for an average fence, unless you have a huge property or unless you need something extraordinarily hot, uh, you're, you're going to be looking at that price. Or you can do a solar energizer, which doesn't need an external source like an outlet or a battery, but those are expensive. <laughs> They're going to be $200 plus, again, depending on the length of fence that it's rated for and exactly how hot you need it to charge. You don't need to have an electric fence as a perimeter fence. You can work with wooden posts. I know locust posts are really popular around here because the trees grow and it's incredibly rot resistant. I don't know what other trees might be common elsewhere, but I know that you can hop on Craigslist and find somebody selling locust posts for definitely cheaper than you could pick them up at the big box store. If you know the right person, <laughs> you might be able to get them for, you know, same, uh, similar to a T-post, like $5 each. And you can use whatever you want to fence it. Um, a lot of people use welded wire. Some people use woven wire. I think welded is a little bit stronger, right? I think you were talking about that with goats before. Woven is because it, it locks into itself. It doesn't break off like welded does. It's kind of a bummer that our entire property used to be electrified, fully fenced in besides the kudzu area. And it's just been so neglected that like trees have fallen on it. It's been crushed. It's just, you know, it's not functioning at this point, but the remnants of it are still there. Like all the posts are pretty rotten out. I'm like, do you know how nice it would be to have this set up already? Um, but we don't really, at this point, plan to do that. If we get electrified fences, it's just going to be the netting that we move the animals in. Um, but we do, however, 
plan to put up at least a partial deer fence for our orchard because stuff's already been nibbling on my blueberry plants this year. <laughs> um, so this isn't something we've put money into yet, but we were just researching it earlier this week. And by we, I mean Taylor. Um, I wasn't even researching it for the podcast. He was just looking into it. Um, so with eight foot fixed knot fence, which is what is usually recommended for deer fence because it's small holes. You could use a bunch of different kinds though. Um, and then 10 foot tall wood posts that are buried two feet in the ground. It's about $550 per 100 feet that you want to fence with that setup. And then we kind of calculated it. Our orchard is about an acre. It's a, it's a really large space. So to do the back side of it and the side that goes along the woods where the deer usually come in, it would be about 400 feet worth. So it'd be about $2,000 to do that. And then if we, we won't do the other side of it though, because we're going to have the goats on the other side of it. And then the front of it, I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to have some sort of fencing solution at some point, probably because we want to keep the ducks down there, but it probably won't be a deer fence because they don't often come around into the orchard. That's interesting because I do have a deer fence set up around my garden and that's approximately what a hundred plus a hundred plus 50 plus 50, like 300 feet perimeter. Mm -hmm. That cost like $465. It's made out of 10 foot tall <laughs> T posts, which are expensive. They're like $15 <laughs> each. Um, and also there's, 10X TNAX is a really popular deer fencing brand. And mm -hmm. that poly netting basically is, is eight feet tall. So zip tying that to the T posts, which are driven two feet in the ground. So they're effectively eight yeah. feet tall out of the ground, even though they're 10 feet tall, right? Same as the wood posts. Uh, that has worked incredibly well for me and <laughs> might be a little bit cheaper. The netting doesn't really work well. We've for us personally um we want to go with a wire or like an actual metal wire fence because we've tried the netting and we have it down in the orchard around our blueberries right now stuff just gets tangled in it and mm. cuts through it and like gnaws on it and it just gets ripped so we we're just gonna you know invest in it at some point that's not something we'll be doing anytime soon probably for the meantime, we're probably going to be just doing individual fence type things around our trees when we put them in because <laughs> trying to invest in that deer fence would be a lot right now. But yeah, um, the netting hasn't worked for us. But again, that's just very dependent on your exact purposes for it. And I have a cat, Mr. Ricky, who likes to get tangled in it. So Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about... It depends on the pests that you're dealing with, right? Like if, if I had a bunch of rabbits that were really determined to get into my garden, that deer fence would not stop them. Not even close. So that's a good point. If you are willing to take the chance on the plastic netting to save a little bit of money, those rolls are about $133 for 150 feet. And the... 10 foot tall T-posts are $15 each. I had to use 15 for mine, plus a couple posts that cut down from the property itself. So maybe add four more if you don't have access to, to wood like that. And then that also includes the price for a couple gates on my fence because I wanted to be able to, for one, drive my car in there if I need to, to deliver things like mulch and compost, which I don't make a habit of. Two, I want to be able to get my really wide <laughs> mobile chicken coop in there because I like to put the chickens in there as a cleanup crew sometimes. And if they need to stay off of the pasture so that I can do things like spread pasture seed because they would think that that pasture seed is absolutely delicious. They would make a meal out of it and that would be very sad. So those are the more specific prices of those things. If you're looking at welded wire back to the perimeter fence, that can get really expensive. For like a 50 foot roll, it's that's three feet tall. It's like $100. Um, so if you're if you're looking for the 100 foot lengths, and especially if you're looking for the taller heights, it, it gets it gets expensive. Those are like $150, $200 or more. The netting that you have on your deer fence also 
you could use that as like a step one and see if that works since it is significantly mm-hmm. cheaper. And then if it doesn't work for you, you could always eventually upgrade it in the mean or and just use that in the meantime. So you can also reinforce just the bottom if you're concerned about rabbits, things that are shorter, undermining the integrity of that really tall fence. You can also reinforce the bottom with chicken wire. I would recommend the one inch chicken wire, the the tinier diameter one um that would be harder for them to chew through not again not impossible but it might save you some money there's definitely some steps you could take to make it cheaper and you know see if it works in the meantime all right are you ready to move on to greenhouses (laughs) i'm scared to talk about this topic because it's gonna make me want a greenhouse (laughs) (laughs) i already do want a greenhouse it's going to be a long time before I get a greenhouse, though. At least the one that I want to build. I might have to get a cheaper one in the meantime, but we'll see. We have a few varieties in here that we kind of wrote down, but I feel like this is kind of impossible to cover every option for a greenhouse because there is just such a wide range. For me, I wrote down the rough estimate for the greenhouse that I want to have in my garden eventually. And that is going to be a self-constructed window greenhouse, which is like using like old windows that you can find on marketplace for five to $10 a piece. My goal is to make about a 16 by 20 foot, if not a little bit smaller greenhouse. It's a pretty big greenhouse. And so for that, I would need around 60 windows and at $5 a piece, that would be $300. Then a polycarbonate roof, which you could use windows for this too, but I personally want to use a polycarbonate roof because it seems significantly easier to do. That would cost around $1,000 on its own because polycarbonate is not cheap. And um, just to be clear, there's a huge difference in like the plastic PVC roofing you can get and polycarbonate. Polycarbonate is very, very strong and the PVC will break so easily. So do not get PVC for things if you don't have to. And then I didn't estimate this because It's just, I would have to have Taylor do it for me, (laughs) Um, the wood for the structure. And then our garden is on a hill. So we'd have to do some sort of excavation and do like a block foundation in there, pour a gravel floor or put down a gravel floor. And probably we have countertops that are piled in our landfill that we plan to break up and rough them up so that they're not slippery. And we'll use those as like pavers in there like stepping stones as the floor. And then obviously you want to do shelving, beds inside of there. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes into it. Any sort of watering systems. I don't know. I haven't looked that far into it, but I estimate it would probably end up being around probably $3,000, if not a little bit more, which it's a lot, but that's a really big greenhouse and it would be high quality. And then I also looked at the very popular right now, Costco greenhouse. It's about seven foot by eight feet. And you can get it from anywhere around $1,200 to $2,000. It's always on sale for different prices. So I wanted to include the range (laughs) in there. And that's just a cedar and polycarbonate. I think it might not be polycarbonate. I'm not 100% sure. And then a little bit cheaper option for the size, I would say, is a 14 foot by 25 foot. And they have a bunch of different sizes too. This is just the cheapest one they offer. Farmer's Friend Caterpillar Tunnel, which is like a high tunnel. And that is listed for $1,200 on the website. But for those that would also require extra tools to like pound the posts into the ground and using a ladder to get it all set up because it's really tall and you got to factor all that stuff in too. But I didn't look into the instructions. (laughs) So (laughs) you're on your own for that. I have also seen people make high tunnels out of, you know, a lumber frame and then they take cattle panels stretch them kind of like a lot of people do with an archway trellis i think you know we both have that but just stretch it inside of that and then throw some greenhouse plastic over it and it's it's a more budget friendly way to you know make something similar to a greenhouse without having to build an actual structure like i think i could tackle a diy a uh, high tunnel way before I could tackle a DIY greenhouse because I I can build stuff, but um, if it's something like a greenhouse, I want it to last, and <laughs> I don't think mine would last. But that's going to be something more in the realm of you know a thousand dollars, a little bit over that. 
which is more accessible for the uh, area of growing space, if that's what you're looking for. Yeah, I think you could do it really, really cheaply with just a couple of like two or three cattle panels, kind of like your sheep shelter, honestly, and just the plastic. The plastic would probably be the most expensive part of that. Um, But I've considered even with our tunnel, just sectioning off part of that and making that like a mini greenhouse during the winter. I might try it next winter if I have the money to get some more plastic for it. That's a good point. My brain goes to what's the biggest I could build. Oh, it would cost a thousand dollars, but not everyone wants to do that or has room for that. So yeah, if you want to make it <laughs> not an industrial size, I don't, you can absolutely do that. <laughs> So something else that's on my list to have in the future that is probably also far down the line is a root cellar in our basement. And um, there are a bunch of different ways to do a root cellar, just like there are a bunch of different ways to do a greenhouse. But for us personally, we want to do one in the north. Actually, no, it's the south corner, but it's the banked corner of our basement. For a retrofit root cellar in your basement, you need to consider ventilation, because you need to be able to relieve off-gassing and bring in fresh air to prevent mold. You need to consider earth shelter, which is, you know, the berm that it's in, which ours would be in the back corner where our basement is buried. Then you need to have like a specific floor in there. So you'd have to either get gravel or some sort of earth, like packed earth to put in there. Those are best. You can have concrete. It doesn't work as well for holding the humidity. You need to consider the humidity. So you might need to purchase a humidifier for it or some way to retain the humidity. And then if you want to make it a little bit easier on yourself, you could put a light in there for yourself, but otherwise it doesn't need that. So that's kind of a you decision. Um, And then you need to make sure you insulate any ducts or hot water pipes, anything that's in the space, because you want it to be completely self-contained. You don't want any sort of AC or heating venting into that space. And then also shelves and storage bins and things like that. So this is just me researching it so far. We obviously haven't built this yet, but in my research, it said you could do it anywhere from about 500 to $3,000 was the general cost. That is a broad range. <laughs> right. It's obviously going to depend on how much space a, a small retailer, if you're just outfitting, you know, like maybe a tiny corner of your basement is going to be completely different than if you're trying to store a winter's worth of food for a family of four. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's the thing is like a, a lot of the time it doesn't need to be massive. You can probably do it pretty cheap because you don't want to keep your your canned goods in the root cellar because they will rust because of the high humidity. So ideally we are going to do just like a five foot by six or seven foot room. Like we don't want it to be huge and just keep root stuff in there. We don't want to keep, and probably cheeses too. We'll probably do some sort of like cheese cave slash root cellar situation. Can I live in your cheese cave? That sounds like a good setup. <laughs> Just hand me a cheese every time I come get get one. That's your job. I'll, I'll learn my key. I'll pay you in cheese. <laughs> you can also build a root cellar outside of your house you know for me i don't have a basement so i don't have the opportunity to just retrofit uh, a part of that to to fit that need but it's on my long list of things that i don't know if i'll ever get to but (laughs) my dream homestead has a root cellar and there's a spot sort of behind my house that i could dig into the bank and and probably construct something there but you can make that out of concrete you can make that out of tires if you want to you can find rocks boulders things from around your property salvage those and make it out of that or you can make it out of something like cinder blocks it's whatever you have access to and and whatever amount of money that you're willing to go to a store and actually spend you can dig it into a hillside that's a really effective way to take advantage of the natural insulating properties of the earth and that's why it makes sense to put it in a basement because basements are usually dug into the earth. And if you're building it, not into a hillside, just separately, and then wanting to cover it back up with earth for those insulating properties, you know, you can do it with fill dirt and then put seed on top of it if you want. But you're going to want to make sure that you have two feet of soil covering the cellar for the, the benefits of that insulation from the earth. And then again, you're going to need shelves to store this food on and bins to put things in. So 
the cost of that if you're willing to do it yourself you're going to be able to save a little bit of money or you can buy them pre-made and stick them in there if you want to save yourself some time it's really up to you you're obviously going to need a door to get in and out of there since it's an independent structure in that case you can also take advantage of some repurposed items you don't have to build an entirely new structure you can take things like old chest freezers and after you drain the fluid from it i think it's called freon fluid because that's a potential contaminant you don't want that going into your dirt once you drain it out you can dig a hole and bury it and that will stay really well insulated you can use new not used <laughs> new septic tanks <laughs> important detail <laughs> <laughs> new obviously because it would be clean but septic tanks are built to be put into the earth um so something like that would work really well or even a precast culvert any sort of you know cavity that you can stick in the ground if you don't want to build an entirely other structure the price for an, an exterior root cellar is obviously going to range very widely if you can find a free old broken freezer on craigslist or facebook marketplace and you can dig a hole for it great that's free if you are gonna go buy a bunch of cinder blocks and fill dirt and seed to make a little hobbit root cellar obviously that's gonna be you know somewhere in the couple thousand dollar range so it's you fit it to you, you fit it to your budget, you fit it to your needs. I feel like we need to reiterate the don't find a used, cheap, or green <laughs> septic tank on Marketplace and or Craigslist. Especially not Craigslist. That just sounds dangerous. <laughs> just get a new one. I feel like that covers our list of general infrastructure decently. So we're going to move on to preserving and kitchen tools now. I know that for both of us, we are huge kitchen people. We love to cook. So the preserving and kitchen items are kind of intense for us. But we try to <laughs> focus on homestead specific things for this. So we're going to start with mason jars. The price is going to vary a lot depending on the size of the jars, the amount that you're getting and where you're getting them. Everyone always says <laughs> you should be getting your jars from Goodwill or a thrift store. In my experience, the jars at Goodwill are one, dirty, two, they don't come with lids, and three, they're like two or three dollars if not more a piece. And I'm like, I have to wash this and it's more expensive than if I were to buy it brand new and it doesn't have a lid. <laughs> so I tend to not get the ones at thrift stores, but I have found that estate sales and garage sales, if you have the time to search them out and actually go to them and, you know, dig around and find things and clean the things, that's the cheapest way to get them. But I personally don't have a lot of time to do that, unfortunately, because I love going to get garage sales. Anywhere online that you buy them really is going to be super expensive. It's going to be like $30 plus for a 12 pack of jars. Highly recommend not doing that. Just go to Walmart or go to your local store. Tractor Supply, they're a little bit more expensive at Tractor Supply usually than Walmart would have them. But you can usually find jelly jars, half pints, and pints for around $13 a dozen. And again, these are 2024 prices. I've noticed since the, the new year has started, the, the prices have gone up a little bit. So quart jars are about $15 now, roughly, for a 12-pack. Wide mouth jars are usually a little bit more expensive. Half gallon jars, right now, I just looked earlier, and a six pack used to be $12 last year. It is now $15 to $17 per six pack. Azure Standard usually has them on sale, and they just started having mason jars. Like it's a new thing in the last six months that they just started making them. And they are, they usually end up being a couple of dollars cheaper than buying them at the store. So I've been stocking up on half gallon jars every time I order and you can get them with or without lids on there. So even with shipping, it ends up being cheaper than Walmart. And then if you are looking to can with mason jars, obviously you need a canner. So there are a couple of different methods you can use. There's water bath canning, which is good for any anything that's acidic past a certain level. Those are going to be a lot cheaper. <laughs> 
water bath canners run about $30, whereas pressure canners, which is the other canning method that you use for foods that are not naturally acidic and don't have that extra layer of preservation to them. There's a couple different kinds you can get. You can get a, you know, Presto is one of the more common kinds. Those are like $150. I have heard that All American is better because you don't have to replace the seal as often, but those are more expensive. The All American pressure canners are going to run you about four hundred dollars, which is you know more than twice. It's pretty significant. And I've also seen a lot of people use the electric pressure canners because they don't have to monitor it as intensely as a pressure canner that you put on the stove. It's it's more of a set it forget it, and then come back to it once it's done. Those are more expensive than the Presto $150 pressure canners that are pretty typical. The electric ones are going to be, you know, start at $200 and then go up from there just depending on the brand itself. I feel like also we should mention that if you have a stock pot or a pot for your stove that's deep enough that you can put your jars in and they are covered about two inches with water still, you could just buy a little metal rack or, you know, like the the grate that you put at the bottom of a canner or the grate that's at the bottom of a pressure cooker or something. I don't know what it's called, but it's like a little metal grate. Um, to set your jars on so the bubbles can go under them, you can use a normal stock pot for water bath canning. I have also seen people use like a kitchen towel on the bottom. I don't know if that's recommended, but I've seen... No, okay. Never mind. I've don't do that. It. <laughs> I've tried it and it just bubbles up and wraps around them and everything tips over. It's a really oh. not good time. <laughs> that's not helpful. Um, but you can use uh, just layer canning rings at the bottom of it still and set jars on top of that. That also works and that's that's free, so. And then moving on past the canning method of preservation, you can, you can dehydrate things. There are cheap dehydrators and there are more industrial <laughs> dehydrators. So the cheap ones are gonna be, you know, they, they can't hold a lot, but they're, they're about, I don't know, a foot, wide, maybe a foot and a half wide by, you know, another foot tall. And those, you, you can find a cheap one for 30 bucks. They're more like 30 to 50 bucks or the larger industrial ones that are larger. You can do more food in them at one time are going to start at about a hundred dollars and then go up from there. Just, just depending on the brand. A few years ago, I think it was 2021 probably, my dad got us a dehydrator for Christmas. And back then it was $200. It's a nice one. It's a Kosori. I don't know how to say it. It's on like on the level of maybe like the Excalibur ones. They're It's really, really nice. It's $300 now though. It has gone up in price significantly. <laughs> or if you get really fancy with it and if you have the budget for it, <laughs> you can also freeze dry items. Freeze dryers are significantly more expensive than dehydrators, but they also preserve food for significantly longer. Freeze dryers, the smallest, cheapest one that I have come across is $1,500. They generally have a few different sizes, but they, they go up to like $3,000. And I don't know if that's an expense that I'm ever going to willingly <laughs> take on. I think most people who get them First of all, you have to be able to buy them. That's like, you have to be able to have the money to purchase them. But a lot of people will do like co the cottage industry sales of candy on Marketplace. You see the freeze dried candy and a lot of people make their money back doing that to like pay them off. But you have to be able to bankroll it first, obviously. And that's just really not going to be in our plans. <laughs> Unless, you know, our YouTube channel is at like a million subscribers one day. I don't really see us getting a freeze dryer. <laughs> With a freeze dryer, you also have to be continuously buying Mylar bags because you need to be able to store your freeze dried stuff in those bags or vacuum. You need to vacuum seal your jar every time you open it to keep them nice and crispy. But I mean, how long, how long can you keep food if you freeze dry it? Because it's like a decade or more. It's a significant amount of time. It depends on the food, but if you have it in a Mylar bag, you can store it for like up to 20 years. That's insane. <laughs> well, the, they don't go bad because there's no moisture content in them to make them <laughs> go rancid or anything or bad. Right. And then for canning, the general rule is a year before it starts losing nutritional value and taste. 
yeah. dehydrating. If I dehydrate stuff, I try to use it within a year. That's not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but again, I just feel like it starts to to degrade and and then obviously there's just potential that it's going to mold or go bad. And then just a couple other kitchen tools that are helpful that either I don't have or that I do have and I use all the time. I don't have a food mill right now and I really, really, really wish I did. I know you do because you invested in one this year when you had all of your batches of apples and you use it for tomatoes too, right? I didn't have it when I did tomatoes last year. But yeah, the apples, it was it was wonderful. I had a KitchenAid attachment one and I do not recommend that. I recommend getting just the hand crank ones. You're going to get a workout doing it, but if for some reason the power ever goes out and you need to do that, like you don't need the power to do that and also it's just they don't break as easily. They're a lot more sturdy, the hand crank ones. And it was like $50. The KitchenAid ones are like over $100. If you get the name brand, if you get the off-brand KitchenAid ones, they're like $90, I think. And that just separates the apple skins or tomato skins and seeds from the actual part of the fruit that you want to keep, right? Yeah. And then usually with that, I, not with the apples, the apples, I just save them and fermented them into cider vinegar, or I just give them to the birds. But with the tomato seeds and skins, I dried them out in the dehydrator and ground them into a powder. And then I just add them to stuff for flavor, like soups. That's what I want to do this year. Also, a vacuum sealer. They range from like $20 to like $500, I think. Probably you could get one more expensive than that. But I would assume that that's a pretty high-end one. Mine was $20 on Prime Day that I got and... It has been one of the best investments because nothing has got, gotten freezer burnt in my freezer. And I usually have an issue with that. So I'm, I've am i loaded all my pasta up <laughs> into vacuum seal bags. All of our veggies from last year are in vacuum seal bags. And you do have to buy the bags for it, but you can usually buy them in bulk and then cut them to your own size. That's like a $20, $30 box. And it's like a thousand feet of the bags. So I would recommend that too. That is also something that I have not bought yet. And I think ultimately I will end up buying one because typically I I water bath can the acidic foods that I can do with that method safely. And then for anything that I can't water bath can, I prefer to blanch and freeze for taste and texture. Mm-hmm. And so I'm putting a lot of vegetables in the freezer and I don't have a vacuum sealer, but here's a hack if you just don't want another piece of kitchen equipment or you just don't want to invest the money in it yet. If you put it in a Ziploc bag and then dunk that Ziploc bag in water, that will force the air out of the Ziploc bag and then you can close it. And you don't have to do that weird thing where you like stick a straw in there and try to suck the air out and then close it really fast. It's not it's not a perfect method, but it works pretty well. I I use that. I appreciated it. And so there's a little tip for you if all you want to do is buy the Ziploc bag like me. <laughs> and then a kitchen tool that I do actually own and that I use all the time is a KitchenAid mixer. This is not something that I bought once I started homesteading because I have always been into baking. I <laughs> got a KitchenAid mixer on something like my 13th birthday and I've had it ever since then. But that is amazingly helpful for you know, baking bread, especially if I didn't have that. <sighs> it takes a lot of time and strength to develop <laughs> gluten in bread, which is what makes it so tasty. Uh, and so that has saved my butt a couple times over. And they are expensive. That is true. They are definitely an investment. KitchenAid mixers, there's a lot of different models you can buy. You can get them secondhand. You can get them new. But they started about $300 and they go up from there. Do you have one of the pro ones? I don't know what they're called. They're like this. They have the adjustable head. Trying to look from here. No, (laughs) I don't think it's a pro. I think it's I think it's one of the more base models that you can get. But I mean, I've already had it for over a decade. (laughs) Yeah, I've had mine for probably seven or eight years now. My mom got me one for Christmas when I was like 19 (laughs) because I'm the same like I'm really into cooking and baking. I, if I had to get one, a new mixer, I would probably get a Bosch, even though they are not very pretty. They're one of the ugliest things I've ever seen. I I don't like how 
KitchenAid's work as far as like <laughs> making multiple batches of things, because usually when I'm using it, I'm trying to make at least two batches at once. And the bowl is just not big enough for that, especially when you're going to like let things rise or yeah, I just, I think I would get a Bosch, but those are like $450. So it's probably more expensive than my model of the KitchenAid. But if you were to get a nicer model of the KitchenAid, it'd probably be on par or cheaper than that. Bosch is better for large batches of things. And I will say it is my personal opinion that the newer KitchenAids aren't made as sturdy as the old ones used to be. Yeah. My, I mean, my mom had one that she got. I don't even know how old that thing is now. It's probably like 60 or 70 years old. That one is even way sturdier than this one that I have now, which I'm sure is way sturdier than what I would get if I picked one up at the store now. I have heard some not great things about people who've bought KitchenAid mixers recently and are having issues with mechanical aspects of it. So it's just something to be aware of. And if you want to invest in more temperature controlled storage space for your food, like I got a chest freezer so that I could keep all of the poultry that I'm harvesting, it's also going to be an additional cost. Chest freezers, you can get a smaller one for around $300. You can get much bigger ones. They tend to rate them <laughs> uh, in the size of deer, which isn't really helpful for me, but I understand why they do that. I get that. They'll be like, this store is half a deer. This store is two deer. <laughs> so, so be prepared for that uh, volume rating system <laughs> when you go look at freezers. But yeah, somewhere, somewhere in between $300 to $1,000 will be your typical chest freezers. So earlier this year, Taylor's dad and um, his wife, they got me, got us a deep freezer for my birthday. And that was about $450. And it's a nine cubic foot Costco one. So um, it's, it's pretty large. It holds quite a bit of food. I do think in the future, I kind of want to stand-up freezer but i've heard that those don't last as long and they are a lot more expensive so stand-up freezers are nice if you have different kinds of food and you want to see what's what i didn't mind getting a chest freezer because i knew i was just going to throw chicken in there and that was going to be that and i was just going to pull off the top you know it's all pretty much the same thing i have turkeys in there too but that's pretty easy to tell. But if, you know, if you're making stuff like pasta and breakfasts and you have all kinds of different things that you want organized and you can, you can see it better and pull what you want without going on a treasure hunt every time, then stand-up freezers would definitely be a better option. Um, they're also, the stand-up freezers are typically a little bit more expensive for the same volume just because they're more shelving. It's, it just comes with the territory. It's actually pretty easy to find freezers and fridges. They're usually a smaller size that you can find on Marketplace on Facebook. I'm sure Craigslist too. I just don't usually look on Craigslist much for stuff. But it's pretty common for me to look for freezers because I just, I'm like, okay, we probably need another one at this point. Um, you can usually find them for like 100 to 200 bucks. And it's usually because people are upgrading to larger freezers or stand-up freezers and they're getting rid of their smaller chest freezers. So you can get them for a good deal. And usually they work. <laughs> it is a risk though buying it secondhand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. And then there's also fridges too, especially if you're harvesting a bunch of root vegetables and are trying to keep stuff cold, but maybe you don't have a root cellar. Maybe you just have a bunch of extra veggies. Maybe you sell extra veggies and you're you're trying to get them cool after you're pulling them out of the garden. Lots of different reasons that you could want extra fridge space. Fridges, I mean, there's nothing really special there. You can get the, the very plain kind of what you think of when you think of like a 90s kitchen the white <laughs> white fridge uh for a few hundred dollars or you can go really fancy i know i upgraded my fridge that was one of the first things that i did when i moved into the house and i got a decent sized one for a little bit over a thousand dollars but i also kept the older one because i know that in some way shape or form i will use it i don't have it plugged in right now because if i plugged it in i think it would short circuit the electricity in my house and i don't want to deal with that <laughs> but i kept it because i really want to use that i don't want to reinvest in that in the future that's actually a really good note about Ooh. um the root cellar using the fridge as a root cellar because you can find again on marketplace 
a lot of the times there will be fridges that don't quite get all the way cold or their freezers don't get all the way cold. And you could always set them to a higher setting and use that as your own like mini root cellar for, for veggies and stuff. Because I think they definitely keep a higher humidity depending on where in the fridge you keep things. So I know people who store, well, they'll store apples in them for like months and we actually have considered doing that and getting one that like is broken kind of where it doesn't get super cold to keep our cider in the hard cider that we made okay the next thing on our list is shelving and the shelving in terms of storing dry goods canned goods just pantry type of shelving so this is also going to range greatly depending on what style of shelving you want how much you need all that kind of stuff we were using wire shelves that are just three foot wide by four and a half or five feet tall. And I just checked the price on those. I actually just ordered another one. It literally got delivered today. Those are $45 each. And we I think we have five of them at this point. I use those for seed starting though. So all of my canned stuff was on those and I need them for seed starting. So I had Taylor build me some wooden shelves. And this is me guesstimating the prices of these things, but... We built them out of two by 12s and those are $13 each. We built them with two by four by eight boards, which are $4 each. And then the trim pieces so that my cats don't knock the jars off the edge are $2.50 each. So for two four foot wide by one foot deep by about six foot tall shelves, it was $100. And those hold pretty much all of my canned goods for the year, this year anyway. We're going to probably build more in the future, but I thought that was a really good deal. How many, and you might not know the answer to this, but like how many mason jars do you think you can fit on those two shelves from all that material, building material you just listed? Uh, about 500 For $100 of material to build shelves, you can fit about f roughly 500 pint size mason jars yeah i have both mixed in there quart and pint and then smaller ones but if you were to go smaller yeah i'd say pint probably 500 four to 500 jars that's a lot more jars so we eliminated one full shelf of jars with the wire shelves we were storing them on before so it's definitely for the cost like buying the wire shelves costs as much as building those wooden shelves and we can fit significantly more. All right, I feel like that covers the kitchen items pretty well. Can you think of anything else to throw in there? I think it's pretty well covered. We can probably move on. To gardening, which is gonna be a beast of a category. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for gardening, I think it makes sense to start with the physical growing spaces themselves. You generally have two options. You can grow in ground in, in the space that you have, or you can build raised beds. Both are popular. Raised beds, obviously, you're having to pay for the investment of that infrastructure, but they are a little bit more aesthetic. Or if you are in a situation where maybe you have, you know, a few inches of soil and then underneath that is rock and there just isn't much soil to grow in, you might be in a space where you want to have a raised bed. Or, you know, if you're in the city and you're worried about digging into the ground because you don't want to be hitting any utilities or things like that, and you just want to throw some uh, wood framing in there, throw some soil in there, and then you know you're good, there are reasons that you might opt to invest in the raised beds. So growing in ground, if you don't need any extra infrastructure, obviously that's going to be free. And then raised beds, like anything else, it's going to depend on the size. But for an average raised bed size, you know, about three feet by six feet, you can build those using cedar fence posts, which is going to be the, the most economical option, most likely for about $40, maybe a little bit more than that. It doesn't have to be a huge investment. There are ways to do it cost effectively. Or if you're building multiple of them and you can be a little bit more efficient with the material, reuse some things, they're going to be closer to $35 each. I know I just invested in building some raised beds in my front yard that Michaela and her husband helped me with. And those cedar fence posts were so much cheaper than anything else that I could have found in the lumber section. And they're not pressure treated and I don't have to worry about any of the additional chemicals 
in that wood like I would have to worry about with with pressure treated wood uh especially growing my food next to it we just built a couple of beds like I mentioned earlier and we made ours a little bit taller and um so they're about 18 inches tall I feel like normally raised beds are like a foot tall but we did 18 inches because we wanted to do Google culture style where we like layered stuff in the bottom, but we still wanted to be able to grow carrots in them. And for those two beds, it cost us about $95 because we did them extra tall. And then just to make them last a little bit longer, we oiled them with tongue oil. It was like pure tongue oil and then a citrus solvent, which is literally just citrus oil. So it's completely organic, um, like food safe materials. Those cost a little bit of money, probably like 15 to $20 each, but you can use them for a lot of beds. And just to specify, tongue oil is T-U-N-G <laughs> type of tree. It's not like a like an actual human tongue, <laughs> just in case there's any confusion about that. Yeah, no, we weren't like licking the raised beds <laughs> <laughs> to seal them. <laughs> And then if you build raised beds, you are typically going to need to buy material or import some sort of material to fill them. You do have a few options there. You can use scraps for free. I filled mine with some wood. Logs is a generous word. They're a little bit smaller than that. Uh, but, you know, brushy scraps from stuff that you're cleaning up in the yard logs from trees that you're cutting down you can fill them with leaves i definitely put a bunch of leaves in there i put a bunch of mulch in there or if you happen to have access to dirt that you're trying to move from another space in your property you can put that in there too or you can import that material you can buy it in bulk as fill dirt you don't always know where that's coming from and especially if you are going to use it for a garden it's not something that I would do. Do with that information what you will. <laughs> but you can. There are sources that you can buy garden soil from that you can be a little bit more confident where it's coming from. I know Soil 3 is a really common source that people buy from. Do you know of any other reasonable garden soil sources? We've gotten fill dirt and topsoil off of marketplace because we needed it for grading around our house and we had so much left over because it was like a $200 like super massive probably whatever the biggest you can get a truck delivery it was more than 10 yards it was a lot the topsoil is like actually really really nice so I've been adding that to our garden and we'll see if there's any side effects I've I've been playing a risky <laughs> game with that. Yeah, even if you buy organic garden soil, you don't always know. I mean, that happened to Jess from Roost and Refuge, right? And she made a whole series of videos about that. And yeah. it, it wasn't even the company being negligent. You know, they, they were testing their soil for a whole bunch of things. It just happened to be a pesticide that got in the, the dirt that they didn't test for and you know it unfortunately affected her ability to grow nightshades for a few years i think she's finally getting it back to a point where she can grow in it thank goodness but yeah it's just it's kind of risky to buy soil no matter the source but um you you can get it in bulk from local companies you can get it in bulk from even places like home depot you can get you know five cubic yards which is roughly half a truckload for like $500, which is an investment. And if you are working on that scale, maybe it's worth it to you. But you can also just go to the, the big box stores and get those small, you know, two cubic feet uh, bags of soil. If, if that's the scale that you're working with, it's whatever works best for you. As far as adding soil to the raised beds we just made, we did that topsoil that I just talked about. And then we, when we first moved here, we got a massive load of compost delivered. We got 10 yards of compost delivered. And that was specifically mushroom compost. It's not like certified organic or anything like that. It was just from our local mulch place because that's what we have access to. And that was 10 yards. And I think it was $46 per cubic yard. So it was around 500 to 550 dollars delivered because they charge a delivery fee too, which that felt like a good deal. We have a lot of it left still. I'm rationing it at this point until we can start making our own. I may still have to get another delivery at some point, but I'm really trying to make that not be the case <laughs> because it is not cheap. And I think that was the cheapest route we could have taken too. 
Um, we might have been able to get some off of Marketplace for cheaper, but I was not willing to risk it with compost specifically. You can obviously make your own compost for free if you are willing to wait for it. You could build a worm farm. I know that you could get into that and make a lot of worm castings and compost that way really fast for not very much investment. I actually used to do this when I lived in, I mean, I, I did it when I lived in a, my like college apartment. Literally, all you have to do is buy two totes, like what you would store, you know, like the big storage containers that you could pick up at Walmart or Target or whatever. If you're not good with tools like me, you can take a, <laughs> uh, <laughs> a screwdriver and like hammer it in, <laughs> make holes in the bottom of one of them, and then don't make holes in the in the bottom of the second one. But you can stack it on top. You literally throw your food scraps in there. You buy worms on Amazon for like 20 bucks throw them on your food scraps and cover it with some moistened newspaper or get your groceries in a paper bag instead of plastic bags, rip that up. It's so easy. It takes up like no space at all. And if you're doing it right, it doesn't smell. You can, no. you can do that for $40. You can get that set up. And then you have straight worm castings, which is one of the best amendments that you can put mm -hmm. in your garden. It makes things grow like crazy. I want to get it started again in the next couple of years because we did it while we were living in the camper. Like we just had it set back outside the camper whenever we were parked somewhere. And we didn't even order our worms. We just went to, uh, you can get them in like the sporting goods section of Walmart or at like a, a bait and tackle store. Like where I'm from back in Michigan, you go to the gas stations and they have a worm fridge for fishing. So I, like, that's just a normal thing. I don't know if that's everywhere, but we got ours for like $5 from Walmart. They have just like a little container of them. Uh, they're not very expensive at all. And the only thing is we eat so many fruits and veggies that we made too much for one container. So when we were in the camper, that was kind of a struggle. We, If we had like three worm farms, I think that would have been sufficient, but we didn't have enough to like, they weren't eating it fast enough. But yeah, it's a, a super way to, a super cheap way to add compost to your garden. So like you were saying before, you know, if you're willing to be patient enough and have the space to make your own compost in a pile in your yard, you can do that for free. Or you can go to somewhere like Lowe's or Home Depot and buy the bags that are somewhere between one cubic foot and two cubic feet. They usually have mushroom compost, like you were talking about earlier. That's typically one of the most cost-effective ones. Um, they, they also can have a couple other types of compost or just straight cow manure, aged cow manure <laughs> if you <laughs> if you want to use that those are you know if you're not trying to work with a ton of space if you just have a small garden that's probably what you're going to be looking for and just depending on what you get the cheapest one is closer to like three dollars for those bags or it can go you know up to seven ten dollars if you're getting some some really high quality organic stuff or you can buy the bigger totes from places like Soil 3 that are a cubic yard, if you don't want to invest, if you're not like Michaela and want to invest in a whole truckload, uh, those Soil 3 sells one cubic yard for about $200. And there are, again, local places that you can check out that would have different, different kinds of things available for different prices. Something that kind of goes along yeah. with soil and compost is mulch. And there are a lot of different ways to get your mulch. Um, some of them are free. So the first free one that everybody talks about, I've been signed up for chip drops since the day we moved here. And not once have we ever gotten a chip drop. Our neighbors have been here for five years and they have never gotten one. So it really depends on your area. <laughs> if you can make friends with tree trimmers or people in your area, I know sometimes we get mail like pamphlets from tree trimmers who are going to be in the area and they want to do a bunch of work all at once. So they're like, hey, we're going to be here. Do you need your trees trimmed? Call give us a call and we'll do it all, you know, next week when we're here. Call those people back and be like, hey, I don't need my trees trimmed, but I want your mulch. <laughs> I have done that. We you could get them from utility companies like Duke Energy or around here or any electrical company. They do a lot of tree trimming around power lines. You can usually get mulch from them. I know, Sage, you have a huge, your driveway is full of mulch from the electric company. 
it used to be that the pile is much smaller than it was before. But yeah, that was the least they could do after they took out my internet from trimming trees. <laughs> and then you can also sometimes, depending on your area, you can get uh, like local, like community, what is it called? It's like municipal compost and mulch that you can go get for free. Sometimes your city or county will just have a place that you can go pick it up and like scoop it into your truck. But unfortunately, where I live, that's not the case. There used to be a free mulch pile about 10 minutes down the highway from me. And it got so out of hand that they started just piling it in the road. And then the I guess it was the city of Asheville had to step in and say, no, you can't, you can't put this here anymore. So I was really sad when that went away. And then serendipitously right after that, <laughs> the, the tree trimmers for the utility company came through and I was like, what are you doing with your mulch? You want to drop in here? <laughs> Make it a lot easier on you. But I have also never gotten a chip drop. And also everyone tells me to sign up for it. So I think chip drop works really well if you are in, a more residential area but if you are kind of out in the boonies more like us i wouldn't count on it but of course you can always sign up for it on the off chance that you'll get lucky one day you can also look on um on their website you can see where recent drops have been and there are no recent drops in our area so it's really just a, a location thing because we kind of are in like a neighborhood area we're just spread out and we're only like five minutes north of town, our town. And it's not a small town. It's a pretty decently sized area. Um, I just don't think that they're here. If you are not a lucky person who has free mulch available to them, you can always buy it. And um, you can get it at landscaping companies, which is similar to the place that we got our compost from. They sell mountains full of mulch. Um you can like go there and they have little samples of all of the different kinds of soils and mulches and colors and all that kind of stuff. And they have them in little boxes. So you can like pick them up and feel them and see what they look like. Plant nurseries will sell mulch to you. Yeah, there was one time in between when the free mulch pile <laughs> disappeared and <laughs> when the power company uh, was able to drop me some mulch that my dad helped me source some mulch for the garden last year and they filled up his truck bed, which is an F-150 for about 60 bucks, which isn't that bad. It was, it was a decent amount of mulch and it covered, I don't know, several beds in, in my garden, which is a pretty big garden. It's <laughs> a lot of mulch. And then you can also buy it at big box stores like Walmart, Lowe's in the garden area. It'll be about $3 for the big bags of it that are about two cubic feet. I assume you could probably get it at Tractor Supply too. That is, at least for me, probably the least, I, I don't want to say economical because it is pretty cheap to do it that way, but it's super annoying. And then you have a lot of plastic bags left over. If you needed like a little bit to cover the top of your bed or just a pathway in a small garden, I feel like that would be the cheapest route to take for it. As far as the non-compost amendments go for adding nutrients to your soil, you can also do chemical fertilizers. I don't think either one of us use chemical fertilizers, uh, and there are a lot of different kinds out there, just depending on what you want. So uh, something like uh, 10, 10, 10, which the numbers refer to the NPK ratio, which is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. I said that in order, right? I think. <laughs> yeah, you did. I know nitrogen's first. I know I got that one right. But uh, yeah, so the numbers refer to the levels of those nutrients. So 10, 10, 10 is equal for all of them. So it's a good all-purpose fertilizer. Another common fertilizer is for something like tomatoes, which would have less nitrogen because you're trying to encourage the blossoms, which I know nitrogen is for leaves and I know phosphorus and uh, potassium are for roots and blooms, but I don't know which one goes with which. So typically for stuff like roses and f things that you're trying to get to flower, you don't want heavy nitrogen. Yeah, the uh, phosphorus, it, like bone meal and stuff, that's for roots. <laughs> Between the two of us, we got it. <laughs> Just from my research on Amazon, if you were to get like five to 10 pounds, usually five pounds are almost 20 to $30. And that is a lot. 
for not a, not a large amount, especially when you have gardens as big as we do. Right. And obviously that depends what you're getting. That depends if you're getting organic fertilizer versus non-organic. That depends on the brand. So the prices are going to be all over the place for fertilizer. I'm not even going to give you a number for that because <laughs> it's going to be it's going to be different than what you look up. But if you're spending more than $100, I can tell you this too much. And if you're spending less than five, I can tell you that's too little. <laughs> but within, yeah. Otherwise, within that window, <laughs> it's just going to vary. If you are not looking to add chemical fertilizers, but you also don't want to buy compost, you can add cow manure. That is a natural fertilizer. I would call it a natural fertilizer. And again, it's going to be in those bags that are similar to what we talked about for, you know, what you could pick up at Lowe's or Home Depot for the compost. And that's going to be 4 to $7 per cubic foot. I think I, so to this date, I really haven't purchased compost. I've been using the hillside of rotted horse manure <laughs> that was already on the homestead. I've made small amounts of compost myself and there are just a couple bags of compost that I've picked up because I didn't want to wheelbarrow all of that <laughs> manure from the bottom of my hill, which now that you've been to my property, I'm sure you can see why. I was just With like, your oh, I'm going to spend $5 and save my back. Um, but other than the very rare occasion that I purchased it out, I so far it's been all from the homestead and i think that's going to change this year i think this year i'm going to actually have to buy compost so cow manure is probably going to be one of the first things that i go to are you going to try and source that from a specific place like try to get manure that hasn't been potentially contaminated with pesticides no you can <laughs> buy organic cow manure at Lowe's and Ace. Those are the two stores that are close to me. So that's what I look at. And there's also a plant nursery that I go to all the time that has really good um, options for organic compost and manures and stuff like that. So I might look at it there or I might just say, whatever, I'll see how the garden grows. Without <laughs> any It'll be an experiment. Maybe I'll regret it. <laughs> The next thing on our list is our seed starting setups. This is another category like many of the other ones that are, you could go from $0 to a lot of money if you wanted to spend a lot of money on this. <laughs> you could start seeds in your windowsill with used pickle jars and soil that you've just like scooped from outside your house um, and then just use the sunlight from the window to start your seeds. That works for some people, and if you're not trying to start a lot of things, that might work for you. Sage and I both have pretty, I think we have pretty similar seed starting setups, but we've definitely invested a little bit of money into them. I think we both use wire shelves and some sort of LED shop light or LED plant light type things, 1020 trays, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. The shelves that I use, I mentioned earlier, they're $45 and I can fit two 1020 trays on each shelf and they have four shelves. So I can fit <laughs> eight, <laughs> math, <laughs> I can fit eight, uh, eight trays onto each shelf and I have multiple of those at this point. I use just like LED shop lights. They're four feet long. So I put two lights next to each other per shelf and they kind of stick off the edges a little bit since my shelves are three and a half feet wide or three feet wide. And that means they like extra extend over the 1020 trays and make sure that everything's getting plenty of light. Those you can get for, they're a four pack. You can get them for $40 on Amazon. And I've got a lot of packages of those. Yeah, I also start my seeds on a wire rack with LED grow lights. Uh, I, I'm a huge fan of soil blockers. So I work with, I think it's quarter inch soil blocks. And then I also have a two inch soil blocker. And then once I graduate from that, I have four inch pots. So between those two soil blockers, those were $80. The price kind of ranges between those. The smaller one is much cheaper. <laughs> I think it's like 25. And then the two inch soil blocker was more expensive. Um, the four inch pots, you can get soil starting pots for all kinds of things. I think you got yours at Bootstrap Farmer. I get mine from Johnny's. Mine come in a pack of 18. That sounds like a weird number, but it's 18 because that's how many fit in a 1020 tray. So it actually does make sense 
those are somewhere between five and six dollars. How much were the pots that you got and how many came in that? So I wanted, I was already ordering from Bootstrap Farmer. And this is another scenario of me investing in, in things. I wanted to make it so that they were going to be cheaper than me trying to buy them at Walmart or on Amazon or elsewhere. And the way to do that was buying them in, the, in bulk. So I got a 400 pack and I definitely use all of them. <laughs> I got a 400 pack, but they are like two and a half or three inch pots. They're not four inch. So that was last winter that I ordered them. And that was, so 2022 winter. And they were a 400 pack for $109, which makes them 27 cents each. But I looked today and they changed their pot design a little bit and they updated the pricing. So you can get a 360 pack now. That's like their biggest package that you can get. And it is now $212. So it's $100 more. And they're now 59 cents each if you do that. And then if you buy smaller amounts, it's obviously more expensive per pot. Mm -hmm. And then we both have 1020 trays that we bought in bulk from Bootstrap Farmer, which they come in a pack of like 35 and then that works out to a little bit less than $5 each. I invested in the, well, invested is the wrong word. I <laughs> scraped along with the <laughs> lower quality, cheaper 1020 trays, and I have broken, I think, every single one of them. So that's why I just said, whatever, Same. I'm done. I'm done breaking these, these trays and wasting my money. I'm going to invest in the good stuff. And so we both have those. You can buy whatever you want, but I really, really recommend <laughs> getting the ones that are going to last because it will save you money in the end. If you buy them in like a multi-pack too, they are just, they're like the same price as the ones that you get from big box stores. And they're so much sturdier, like significantly better. I, I cannot recommend those enough. I hate those the mm -hmm. flimsy plastic ones are so bad. <laughs> and then as far as what you start your seeds in, you can get seed starting mix if you want. That is not intended for them to grow in for longer than a few days. That is meant to germinate them and then you upgrade them to different soil if it's specifically called seed starting mix, just so you know. That tends to be a little bit more expensive. Those are typically really heavy in more expensive materials like peat moss. So that's kind of why. But you can get seed starting mix for about $35 for a big bag. And by big bag, I mean approximately the same size as the bags we were talking about for the compost from Lowe's or Home Depot or, or wherever. I like to start my seeds in potting soil. I think that works really well for the soil blocks. And I think that works really well for leaving them there until I'm able to transplant them outside, which in some cases is months. I spend about $13 per bag. Again, same size bag. But that's also because I make sure to get organic certified just because that's what I prefer. You can get it cheaper if you don't want the organic stuff. The potting mix method is what I prefer too. And I didn't do it last year, but typically what I do with that, since that usually comes in, it has bigger chunks of things in it sometimes, like little wood chips and stuff. You can take like a hardware cloth or something and kind of sift it. And then it's pretty much the same uh, texture as seed starting mix, but you have all the extra like feeding properties in there that will help it last longer. So that's just a little trick you can use. But I tend to start my seeds very early compared to a lot of people or what a lot of people who just go get their soil mix from big box stores would do. So I usually start a lot of seeds in January and February. And a lot of the times you can't find <laughs> seed starting mix or potting soil at stores at that time. So I try to buy it in the fall. And typically, if you look really carefully outside of Walmart or in their garden center, you can find things on sale. This year, we found piles and piles and piles of bags of organic potting mix and organic seed starting mix for a dollar a bag. And I looked up the prices of those normally. The seed starting mix, it's 12 quart bags, so they're a little bit smaller. And they're usually about $9 a bag. And the potting mix we got, I looked that up. It's a, a one and a half cubic feet and that's usually about $10. So that was a score. We spent like $10 total on like 15 bags. And then obviously 
there's the cost of seeds. Seeds are a pretty important component if you're going to grow a garden. You can also buy started plants if you want. Uh, we typically tend to work with seeds because we grow so many things. Seed packets really depends on what you're getting. If you are buying seeds that are heirloom, that are certified organic, those tend to be a little bit more expensive. Those will be, you know, up, up to about $6 for a packet of seeds. But you can also find seed packets for closer to, you know, $2.50, $3. And typically you're gonna have enough seeds in a seed packet to grow more than you need in one season. Usually that can stretch you two or three as long as the seeds uh, continue to have a good germination rate. There are a couple things that we grow. I know you grow a bunch of soybeans, you know, corn I buy in slightly bigger volumes. There, there might be things that one seed packet wouldn't be sufficient, but those are really the exceptions to the rule. So, you know, a few dollars here and there doesn't sound like a huge investment, but also on the volume that we grow at. <laughs> uh those add up fast if you are buying seeds at five dollars a seed packet and you want to grow 20 things that's a hundred dollars so i always get a little bit of a sticker shock when i check my cart when i'm <laughs> buying seeds for the year it it really does sneak up on you if you don't like working with uh, seeds from the very start, you can also buy starts at a nursery or, you know, somewhere, somewhere like Lowe's. Those are going to be more expensive. You are going to, to spend a little bit more money just because someone else has put the time, effort, and energy into starting those seeds for you. So that really depends on what you're buying. I tend to see starts ranging from $3.50 to, you know, up to, I don't know, sometimes seven to ten dollars for a plant i can think of a handful of herbs or things that are organic and <laughs> hard to grow that they go for for ten dollars a plant so it depends on on what you're getting if you're trying to outfit a vegetable garden you know a lot of people are buying tomatoes what do you it's been a long time since i've bought a tomato start what do you usually see tomato starts at the store for is that like five six dollars so it's it's tough because a lot of the times you get them in multi packs, but for some things you can just get one plant. I would say like three or four years ago, the average seedling that you buy at the store was like two ninety eight or three ninety eight. They're like five ninety eight now. All of them, like the cheapest ones. If you want something like lavender or like anything that's slightly bigger than like the smallest you can get, it's going to be like ten plus dollars. I usually don't buy starts. But I think tomatoes, if you get the smaller ones, they're still around like $6 per plant. Now, if you get them at Lowe's or something, the burpee, it's usually burpee gardening seeds or seedlings. I am going to try and buy chives this year because for some freaking reason, I cannot get a single chive seed to start for me. I've never been able to. So I'm just going to plant it and then I'm going to split it in future years. I'm going to get like three starts this year from the store. And then I'm planting them all and I'm just going to separate them and then be like, you know what? <laughs> F you. <laughs> Seeds. I can't, I can't stir chives either. I'm good with all the, all the other alliums. I'm, mm -hmm, I'm fine too. with them. So I do not understand what it is about chives, but I struggle with the same thing. And I, yeah, I, I'm always like, whatever. I'll just buy it at the nursery. I'm done. I'm over it. <laughs> Something else that ties into the garden, it's sort of garden infrastructure, I would say, is trellises. You can make trellises out of a whole heck ton of things. You can use sticks or twigs from your property and twine. You can make like bean teepees out of those or just actual trellises. You could use um, tea posts with uh, chicken wire would work. You could use cattle panels. So you could find all of your stuff for free on your property and like kind of forage it, use vines. I don't know. There's a lot of options. Our trellises, we have a multitude of them. All of them are made out of cattle panels because we just wanted to invest in them and get it over with and not have to worry about it anymore. We spent like $700 on our trellises last year in T-posts and cattle panels. So we have a 24 foot long cattle panel tunnel. We have a four foot long, just one cattle panel tunnel. And then we have three 16 foot long horizontal tomato trellises that we use. I guess we're going to use them for peas and tomatoes this year. So... T-posts and cattle panels add up quickly. <laughs> yeah, 
that's something that I had wanted to add to my garden the first year and I just couldn't afford it. I mean, <laughs> even even tomato cages nowadays are like seven dollars each. And when you're growing thirty five to forty tomato plants and you're looking at the cost of all those tomato cages, it, you know, <laughs> it's going to be the same price to add the fancy, you know, cattle panel trellis at that point. So why not? They kind of get bent out of shape really easily. And I feel like a lot of them aren't super tall. So the tomatoes can't really fully grow and then they all tip over. I don't like the little cages. But I did use the cages when I had a small garden. You know, I haven't always had a quarter acre garden. I used to grow out of a plot that felt like it was one by one, even though it was much bigger than that. So they have their place. And when, when I only had three tomato plants, yeah, I was using the tomato cages. Another thing that I have seen people do around our area specifically, bamboo is kind of a thing that people have planted in the past and it goes just wild and it needs to be chopped down often. So right down the road across the street from us, there were there's like a stream down there and somebody new bought the house and they were taking out like loads and loads and loads of bamboo just trying to get rid of it because it's like invasive. So you can find bamboo for really, really cheap or for free on Marketplace here and you just have to go get it. Like you have to go cut it or, you know, load it into your truck or whatever. And that's a good way to make trellises as well. You could use them as stakes, just like a single bamboo, or you could make like a lattice trellis if you wanted to tie them with twine or whatever. So that's a good option too. Low tunnels are another garden infrastructure. So for someone like me, who's not at a place where I can really have a greenhouse, uh, low tunnels were a cool experiment. I haven't quite decided if I'm really into it, but I do like it for some things. So generally you build them out of 10 foot long EMT conduit. And that became the material of choice because they used to be like two or three dollars. They are no longer two or three dollars nowadays. They're more like eight, but it is still cheaper than what you can find a lot of other materials for. You can also use uh, PVC and bend it over and just hook it onto stakes that are in the ground. But I have heard that PVC can degrade pretty quickly and, and break, and then it's not always compatible with the things that you want to you know, put put on top of your low tunnels like greenhouse plastic. I know the greenhouse plastic that I use, they specifically say do not use this with PVC. So something to be cognizant of. And if you are getting that EMT conduit, which is metal, then you're going to need a hoop bender as well. The hoop benders tend to run somewhere around $100. You can get different sizes. And so it just depends on where you source it and what kind of bender it is. And then, of course, the whole point is that you you cover it with something. So you can cover the hoops with insect netting. You can cover them with Agrabon, which is kind of a sheer white fabric, very fragile <laughs> fabric that's used generally for frost protection. You can cover it with greenhouse plastic to sort of make like you know, tiny little greenhouse. You can cover it with shade cloth. There's a lot of different uses for it. And of course, the cost for those materials is just going to depend on what it is. I have looked for shade cloth before because it's something that I'm interested in to try to grow lettuce and things. And every single place that I find it, it is incredibly expensive. So it's not something that I've invested in. You know, Johnny's has it for sale, but it's like $300. So <laughs> I'm not, I'm not in a place to buy that right now, but, you know, insect netting is pretty cheap. You can find that in a variety of different places. Uh, Agrabon is going to run you about $75 for a hundred feet and greenhouse plastic. Again, depends on where you get it, but where I got mine, it was about $75 for 50 feet. The fiberglass hoops they're cheap, but honestly, the conduit is so affordable still, even if the price has been raised, that the quality of them are probably so much better than what, what you get with the, the fiberglass ones. Yeah, none of mine have gotten damaged and I've had them for a couple years. They're they're sturdy and they're definitely <laughs> outliving <laughs> the Agrabon and the greenhouse plastic. So we have a little list of general equipment and then we're going to have later on, after the next thing, we'll have tools and other equipment <laughs> but this is kind of general garden equipment so a broad fork they can cost you 150 dollars or more a nice pair of garden shears is about 15 dollars 
You can also go to the Dollar Tree and I've gotten some there. They're not great quality, but they work for a dollar. I think it's a dollar 25 now. A trowel will cost you $10. Usually you can get those in like little hand tool sets for the garden and they'll range from like 10, 15 to $30 um, for like five tools. And then a wheelbarrow is gonna cost you anywhere from like 60 to $150, depending on how nice of one you get and whatever size you wanna get. If you are looking for a cost-effective but quality wheelbarrow, the only place that I was able to find one was Ace. All of the other places that I was looking, the wheel the wheelbarrows were like $150 or more, and I could not for the life of me figure out why. So if you're looking for one, check out Ace. <laughs> and then there's the cost of live plants. So we already went over seedlings, but there's also things like fruit trees and berry bushes, stuff like that. Fruit trees uh, depends. So you can get really small bare root fruit trees for fairly cost-effective if you are then willing to wait for the years that it's going to take them to produce. So you can find them as cheap as $20, but if you have a rare variety or if you have uh, an older tree or if it's coming, you know, pre-potted, those are going to be a little bit more expensive. I mean, I know I've bought some trees that are more than $100 because I wasn't willing to wait as long. Uh, so it, it really just depends on what you get or where you get them. And then berry bushes, you can also get some of those bare root. It, it just depends where you're ordering from. But I know that the company that I ordered my bare root fruit trees from also had some of those. So I have bought those in bulk to save a little bit of money, but they do still <laughs> cost a decent amount. That's going to run you, you know, $20 to $50. I also see a lot of blueberry bushes. I actually saw them at the nursery when I was there last. And they're, you know, about $30 for a relatively mature blueberry bush that's going to produce at least some <laughs> in the next growing season. All right. <laughs> you ready for the last thing on our list? We have general tools and equipment. I call it a weed whacker. Sage has a weed eater on here. <laughs> I've heard people call it a weed whipper. There's a lot of names for it. It's going to cost you 100 to 250 ish dollars, depending on which kind you go for, whether it's a gas one or an electric one. Our chainsaw, he got kind of like a fancy one, but he got it off Marketplace and it was $500. I know that you can get cheaper ones than that. Yeah, mine was about $250. I also like to use electric equipment. Um, I know that that still uses fossil fuels in the process of it, but I don't have to breathe it. I don't have to mix oil and gas and do whatever shenanigans that you have to do to maintain tools like that. I That's so far out of my realm or out of my depth. So my tools are a little bit more expensive. I think because they are electric, there are cheaper options that are I'll call conventional. And then there's things like shovels and garden hose and garden rakes and leaf rakes. All of those things are going to be like 10 to 15 or up to 30 or $40, depending on what brand you get, where you get it. I would say at Lowe's, roughly everything, all those things I just listed are going to be around $30. And then loppers, those can get really expensive because you can get ones that extend super far, but I would say the average ones are around 20 to $50. A T-post driver, that is something that I didn't think would be as expensive as it is. But for some reason, it's like fifty dollars. Um, I like I get it. Yeah. It's really really heavy. <laughs> it's a lot of metal. But oh my goodness, it's expensive. We had to get T post clips and like the clip tool too for doing our trellises. I don't know if you've gotten that, but I want to say that was like twenty or thirty dollars too. They're they're kind of expensive. I know those clips are really strong and they're really good, but I hate them with a passion I cannot describe. So it's like you know what whatever. I'm just going to use zip ties and I'm going to have to replace them. And I don't care because it's worth <laughs> it to me to not mess with these clips. I'm so over it. A uh, hay fork. Is that like a, just like a pitchfork? Yeah, kind of like a pitchfork. I resisted buying that for so long because it was $60, which is kind of expensive. It's like a single tool buy for me. And my friend kept nagging on me. She was like, I'm telling you, it'll change your compost turning game because <laughs> I have weird <laughs> conversations like this with my friends. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're right, but like, whatever. And now that I have one, I'm like, why did I not invest in this sooner? This makes my life so much easier. So it's expensive, but it's worth it. Okay, gloves. 
I have leather gloves that are like cold weather insulated leather gloves. I use those for chores every morning when it's cold outside specifically. And then if I'm doing anything where my hands are gonna get wet, I like to use those because they are pretty waterproof. Those were like $25, so it was kind of an investment, but I try not to use them in the dirt too much so that they stay good for other things. But I go through the, the gummy garden gloves like it's nobody's business. They're like $6 a package at Harbor Freight for I think a three or four pack. I'm an, I'm an anti-glove gardener. I hate wearing gloves. I I don't even know what I would wear gloves for other than like nitrile gloves for harvesting chickens or something. Boots. I had to buy boots specifically for the homestead. One of them I paid like $120 for and the other one I paid like $40 for because they have these sales. Like every week they have two items on sale. And so it's like a hundred dollars off. I started with some just Target rain boots that I bought for $20, you know, years ago. And those uh, did not survive the first season on the homestead. So I had to get some more waterproof boots. I went for hunter boots. I thought that those would last a little bit longer. I know those are fancy. Let's just... I just wanted them. Okay. Um, <laughs> those were like a hundred dollars and I wear them pretty much every single day. I also have a pair of Hysia boots. That's one of the only things that I have ever done a collaboration on. So I did not pay for those boots. I think they're ordinarily like $60, but just to be super upfront about that, I did get them for free. And then there's also just general safety equipment, things like safety glasses. There's been so many times when I've been like, I don't need the safety glasses. I'm just going to weed eat this real quick. And then I get a blade of grass in my eye and then I have to take <laughs> 10 minutes to flip it out and this whole thing. Just wear the safety glasses, okay? Uh, they're, like, they're like $10 and I also lose them a lot and have to replace them. You can get really fancy ones if you want, but I don't do that because I would immediately lose them. So I just get, you know, the cheap ones at Lowe's that I can find. Also hearing protection when you're driving T-posts. Like I drove a bunch of T-posts in a row to um, construct my perimeter fence. That is very, very loud. It is painful. And that can do some serious damage. So please just get the earplugs. Just get, get the hearing protection. It's worth it. It's not that expensive. I think the last time I bought it, it was like, what, $10 for <laughs> several of them? Also, zip ties and duct tape are just really underrated things to keep around the homestead. I can't, I can't even count the number of times that I'm like, where are those zip ties? That would be perfect for this. So they can get kind of expensive, especially if you get the longer ones, they do get to like $10, $12 a bag. And I feel like every time I buy them, I'm like, why are these this expensive? But I also buy the really big packs because I use them all the time. And then I don't even know what the price of duct tape is. So reasonable seems like, I don't know, between five and $8, no? I think that's like $7 now. Okay, tools. Neither of us are super well-versed in tools, but we are gonna do our best for you guys. <laughs> We um, consulted well, Taylor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, thank goodness for him. I asked him earlier to send me some prices for the list of things that we were kind of talking about today. And he told me his general tool starter kit that he got was about $1,000. But he did mention that that is not something he uses like tons for the homestead stuff. Like it's kind of just like very general. And I think he got it back when he was starting automotive engineering school, like for that specific type of stuff. So I don't know how relevant that is. I know you Sage got a like starter kit too. I got it. Yeah. I got a starter kit. It was DeWalt. It was $600 and it had, I'm going to forget a few things, but it had a, a drill. It had a circular saw it had a, I don't know the proper names of tools, but it had another kind of saw in there. It had, I think, an impact drill, impact mm -hmm. something. The people who know tools will know what I'm talking about. But the things that I use the most often are the drill, Lifesaver, and the circular saw, which is now broken. So I haven't used it since then. But I think, I think if I replace the blade on that, that it would start working again. These are other things that he gave me a list of. <laughs> a sawzall. We use that for everything. A lot of clearing of branches and things that aren't big enough to get the chainsaw out for. 
Uh, that was about $180. Again, we try and get all Milwaukee stuff so that we can just have the few batteries that we have and not have to have a bunch of chargers and batteries everywhere. We have a leaf blower that came in like a multi-pack with our weed whacker. And then that was, so that was $100. And then we've invested in a couple lawnmowers. <laughs> the first one we got, we desperately needed one to kind of get things going when we first moved here. So we found a cheap one off of Marketplace for 500 bucks. That lasted maybe six months and it still <laughs> technically turns on, but you have to blow up all the tires and do a bunch of stuff. And I couldn't start it if I wanted to. It's a, it's a whole deal. It takes probably at least a half hour to start every time. So we don't use that one. We ended up getting a $2,700 one brand new next. And that one is lovely. Somehow the tires still go flat, even though it's brand new, but story for another time. <laughs> uh, our wood chipper, we also got used for $500 off marketplace. That is no longer in existence. It completely broke, unfixable kind of break. If we wanted to replace that one, I think it would be around $2,000. So that is why we have not replaced it yet. Those things are really expensive. Even the ones that really don't chip up a lot of stuff like they're really not high quality ones and you can't do like huge branches or anything with them those are still a minimum five hundred dollars and then our drill was two hundred dollars we just got an axe recently and a splitting mall because we are planning to install a uh, wood stove and stuff so we want to start making firewood and the axe was fifty dollars the splitting mall was seven hundred dollars we got a harbor freight like metal sided or like the metal mesh sided garden carts that you can like flip down the side so it's like a flatbed that was 180 dollars, but they go up to like 300 if you want to get a different size or anything or higher quality ones probably and then we were gifted another garden cart which was a gorilla dump cart and though the one that we got specifically was $350. And then there's also things like tractors and other equipment that neither one of us have. Obviously, some people who have larger homesteads have tractors, but those are the price of cars. I mean, that's that's a really significant cost. Yeah, there's all kinds of other heavier equipment. You know, some people are out here using bulldozers. I'm definitely not operating at that scale, but those sorts of things, what you need to know is they're really expensive. Yeah. <laughs> Anything, really expensive. <laughs> anything more than like $2,000 is not even like in my, my head space is like a possibility yeah. for me to buy. So, <laughs> and there is, there is the cost of the actual land and the house and the homestead itself. That's kind of tricky because for one, you're going to be paying to live no matter where you are, whether you're renting or paying a mortgage, owning a house in a city. Um, so it's not necessarily an a additional cost on top of now you might you might invest in property and maybe you're paying more uh, in a mortgage than you would if you were buying a house in the city i know for me i'm paying actually less to have a mortgage than i was paying for a one bedroom apartment in colorado which is like mind-blowing so it, it gets tricky when you start looking at those costs and the, the price of land and houses ranges so much that it's impossible for us to really quantify here i mean you can you can go on places like zillow and and do that research if if you want to but for us to try to cover that just doesn't make a whole lot of sense i've put this out there before so like i'll just say it right now we live in a decent sized town i wouldn't call it a city we are an hour from three major cities. So we're an hour from Asheville, we're an hour from Charlotte, and we're an hour from Greenville, South Carolina. So we have access to all that kind of stuff, but in all the houses around us, we are in kind of like a neighborhood area where everybody has at least an acre, I would say. Like they're, they're bigger properties, but it is like neighborhood vibes. It's just kind of spread out. The house next door to us, if you look at the Zestimate on their house, it's around $650,000. And they have, I think, two less acres than us or maybe like almost the same acreage as we do. House is much bigger. Our house was originally listed for $325,000. And no way is worth that. It's a hot mess. Needed a new roof, was leaking, had mold. Obviously the basement floods every time it rains, all that kind of stuff. We ended up negotiating it down to $197,000 and we have eight acres here. Just putting those numbers out there, Western North Carolina, 
around Asheville gets more expensive than where we are. Um, I assume that your place probably costs more than ours just because of your proximity to Asheville. I've never put the numbers out there, but I'm not necessarily against it. So I am much closer to Asheville than you guys are. My property is like, I think two one hundredths shy of three acres. So I call it three acres. It came with a lot of existing like farm structures. You know, I have a hay barn. I had a chicken coop. I have a run and shed and there was an existing pasture structure. There was a horse corral. Like th there were things here already. My house is old. It is structurally sound, but like it, it definitely needs some love. Any house that old is just going to need some general maintenance. And like the whole thing is wood paneling. <laughs> <laughs> It gives you Super sexy. <laughs> but it's, it's like it's original. It's actually real wood paneling. It was originally listed for three hundred and ten thousand. I did not pay that. One thing that I did do was I paid more for it so that the seller would cover the closing costs because I didn't have help buying the house. So if I had to pay the closing costs on top of the down payment it wasn't going to happen for me. So we got that under 300,000 with those additional considerations in there. I, have, I haven't quite figured out if I feel like I overpaid for it. Is it worth it when I do it again? Yes. Do I think I, pro I could have gotten it cheaper? Probably. That's fair. I honestly feel the same way about ours because with how horrible of a state it actually is in, um, I think we should have been able to get it for less, but it was a struggle to get it for how cheap we did. So I'm grateful for being able to get it that much cheaper than they had originally had it listed. But with the landfill and all the trash and all that kind of stuff, it's I'm still like, okay, we could have gotten it for cheaper and it would have been justified in my mind. Both of those, I would say, are pretty cheap in terms of real estate in general, especially when you get closer to cities. And I guess just some additional context on land in general, obviously raw land is going to be the cheapest option, but that means you're going to have to cut down all the trees. That means that there's no utility hookups. You're going to have to pay for that. You're going to have to permit it. You're going to have to figure out where you're going to live. So yes, raw land is cheap, but it comes with a lot of pain and permitting and all, just things that I, I thought about and immediately became overwhelmed with and was like, nope, not worth it. I think buying raw land, if you are able to bankroll the construction without using a loan, that is definitely a cheaper route. But if you have to do a construction loan, it's going to be minimum like $400,000 no matter what you do. It's, it's ridiculous. Hopefully this gives you all a very good idea of what you would spend if you were starting your homestead for school from scratch, like I know a lot of you are, or are looking to. And hopefully we covered all of the different items and different cases that you're looking at. But if you are looking for an example of someone who has done this, what it looks like from starting it to getting it to an operational place instead of just a list, I posted a YouTube video of everything that I can think of that I spent on my homestead and all of the different categories. You know, I did animals, I did garden I did general equipment I did infrastructure and you know what I've spent on feed things like that what that looks like in real numbers over you know the first couple of years of, of building a homestead it's just a little bit different than how this information's been presented if you're interested in that please go check it out we will throw a link to that down below that was a really good video Sage does like a full cost breakdown and total in that and it's made me want to try and do that for ours too, but I don't know that I can actually fully convey how much money we've spent as far as like our renovation and the the infrastructure we're building and stuff. I might try it. We'll see. <laughs> it's scary to see that number on paper. I don't recommend it. I wouldn't have done that if I hadn't made that video. <laughs> and then I saw the number and I was like, okay. <laughs> It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. <laughs> if anybody is still around and listening after this really long episode <laughs> yet again, we are so grateful that you have listened through this entire thing. And we hope that you have found some sort of help or enjoyment in listening to us list off all of these <laughs> numbers. Um, next week, we are going to be talking about seed starting and we're going to go in depth about our setups and um, hopefully it'll be a little bit shorter of an episode. <laughs> 
Thanks for joining us on this episode of She Said Homestead. We hope you enjoyed our chat. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to hear from you. Send your homesteading stories to us at shesaidhomestead at gmail.com. We can't wait to share them on the air. To stay connected, follow us on Instagram for updates and sneak peeks at what's coming up next. If you like video podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the She Said Homestead YouTube channel too. We can't thank you enough for being part of the She Said Homestead community. Until next time, happy homesteading.